Now we have our chief guest, Professor Indra Ramarao, and I'll take two minutes to introduce ma'am. She's the former president of Indian Sociological Society. She has also served uh, earlier as secretary of the Indian Sociological Society in 2014 and 15. And uh, ma'am is currently the honorary president, Alumni Association, Department of Sociology, University of Mysore. Uh, Madam is well known for her works on gender issues in forest management, girls' education, building capacities of women in local self-governance institutions. She's also a columnist in leading Canada newspapers, and her major works include themes in sociology of education, studies in Indian sociology, gender and society in India, as editor in two volumes and many Canada books on uh, Canada books on sub themes uh, on feminism, women and culture and research methods. Uh, Ma'am is uh, an honorary adjunct professor at the University of Iowa earlier. This is in Midwest US. She is uh, also a contributor and editor of subject uh, encyclopedias, dictionaries journals, theme-based books, and translation projects. She heads a team that translates uh, a great uh, sociologist, uh, Anthony Giddens, uh, work on sociology into Canada. Uh, besides being involved in uh, many other translation projects and also evaluation of forest programs in Karnataka. Thank you, ma'am, for agreeing to be the chief guest and she will speak on internal migration during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Ajayalu. Good morning to all of you. Professor Raj Shekhar, Professor Paramjit Singh Judge, President of ISS, Professor Chandrasekhar Bhatt, Dr. Munir, all my colleagues in ISS, the University of Hyderabad, student friends, and colleagues from across the country who are here. Thank you for this opportunity to be part of this event, you know, which is so important in understanding the crisis situations that we are facing. I understand that uh, there is a restriction on time because you have another session that has to start at 12 o'clock. So I'm just making a very brief presentation. I've just put my thoughts on paper because I'm one person generally likes to speak, but I want to make sure that I just don't overshoot the time. Uh, well, today, uh, you know, uh, I would uh, like to speak on a few aspects of internal migration and Professor Judge in his inaugural address has referred to some of those issues already. So I just would share with you some of my thoughts. And I thought I would divide my presentation into two, you know, um, two sections. The first, talk a little bit about the situation of the migrants and also end it by talking about what options are available to us for policy. Because we cannot just be talking about problems, but there is also a way of coming out of these problems. Uh, and I think that as students of sociology, we have to discuss that because I have always believed that sociology is action. And so we have something to give back to society. So I'll start by uh, saying that uh, we all know, of course, that the migrants have borne the brunt of uh, the COVID uh, induced uh, you know, upheavals that we have seen. And I just want to start by saying the word migrant is not as simplistic as it is uh, made out to be. Because uh, I think in the context of uh, COVID, what I want to say is in a broad parlance, the migrant group in the context of COVID could be divided into uh, two categories, internal and external. However, within each of these two groups, there is no homogeneity. When we, we just talk of migrants as if it was a homogeneous group of people. Yeah. But we have to be very uh, uh, you know, conscious of the fact that it's not a homogeneous group. I would ask a very basic uh, 
uh, question and that relates to the choice factor in migration. Uh, what I want to say is among the groups, both internal and international migrants, there are migrants by choice and also migrants who chose to leave their homelands because of various forms of deprivation uh, that they were experiencing. Again, both in external and internal migrant groups, there are differences of class, caste, gender, region, religion, and so the impact of migration cannot be understood disregarding the social categories uh, in which the migrants are placed. So in my brief presentation today, I'll confine myself to a few issues that need to be focused, both, as I said, in understanding the situation of migrants and also working out a possible policy option. And to start with, estimates regarding the number of migrants differ from one data source to the other. But the World Bank, in a recent uh, report, has said that about 40 million internal uh, migrants are affected due to the lockdown which was brought into effect uh, to contain the pandemic. Well, in the very first phase of the lockdown, when all support systems collapsed, Neither the state nor the employers, ranging from those who stayed in the comfort of their uh, uh, safe, secure homes, to the owners of businesses of various hues, came to the rescue of these migrants. Now, since there is a close relationship between migration and marginality, the worst affected are Dalits, OBCs, minorities, women in all these groups, children in all these groups, and the poor in general. So the sudden declaration of the lockdown took them by surprise. And since the internal migrants included both interstate and intrastate migrants, the worst sufferers were interstate migrants. And now just uh, to get a profile of these interstate migrants, well, it's a well-known fact that a significant number of these migrants have come to other states in search of livelihoods and better life prospects. So they come mostly from the poor, rural, and historically disadvantaged caste groups. So what they are going through, they have actually been living with, is what I call a multi-layered marginality. Well, as seen in feudal relations, uh, economic and political hegemony, patriarchy, and an insensitive capitalist market controlled economy that exploits their labor, but is not willing to share even a little of the profit that they are making by using the labor of these groups. According to an estimate, migrant workers contribute 10% of the national GDP. And the major sectors Using migrants are textiles, construction, stone quarries, mines, crop transplanting, rickshaws, cabs, fast food joints, security system, hospitality industry, street vending, domestic work. I'm, I'm only naming a few. There are, of course, many more. Now, the, uh, the lockdown, you know, where everybody was told, stay safe, stay at home. Uh, well, I always wonder what the word home means to different groups of people. For those, you know, who have a, who live in what I call as the comfort zone. You see, the home may mean a safe and secure roof under which we live. We can, of course, buy whatever we want, cook whatever we want, notwithstanding the psychological and other uh, um, hassles through which many people who are living in these confined situations are going. At least there is a home. But even the word home does not mean the same thing to everybody. So lockdown, you see, no doubt told us to be safe and secure at home. But you see, uh, not everybody could afford that. So those in comfort zones stayed safe. But many of these migrants were ghettoed in closed conditions and did not get healthy food or fresh air or you know, even a preventive health care. So when the lockdown was relaxed, 
trains and buses were no doubt designated to take these people back home uh, when they wanted to. A newspaper report that was published, you know, when this process of uh, movement back to their homelands started said that the number of migrant workers who took the special designated trains as 60 lakhs and the number of trains that went to different parts of the country were about 4,450. But what about the conditions in these trains? When we talk of internal migration, you know, that is why I said to talk of the whole group as if it's all, you know, uh, having living in similar conditions is a basic mistake. What about the conditions of the trains and the buses? You see, we have in a hierarchical system, I think we have always lived in a system where, you know, the hierarchy gets translated even in living conditions, traveling conditions, etc. So what, I don't know, you know, the trains that took people, well, we always have this patronizing attitude when we behave and we talk as if, you know, giving food, giving packets and yeah. transporting them from one uh, part of the country to another is a big favor that we are doing. But there were other issues like uh, what were the safety measures in those trains, people rushed and what about the costs? There was a huge uh, uh, issue involving the state and the center, state governments and the center regarding this and were distances maintained, what kind of facilities were provided. Of course, the state did make some arrangements and I know that a few civil society institutions also chipped in. But, you know, to talk of this migration back to their homes is not as simplistic. And I think that we so students of sociology really need to make serious studies, micro studies, I would say, and use that as a base for not just COVID related policies, but for action in future. Now, another serious issue that relates to internal migration is the status of migrants when they go back home. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are studies and there are also discussions where people are talking about it. It's okay that they have left your place, but what happened when they went back? Now, quickly, I might tell you that you see Bangalore, for example, is under lockdown now the last three, four days. They say it is going to last, you know, till about 22nd and there will not be a further extension. But when the lockdown was declared on Saturday and would, uh, they knew it would come into effect from Tuesday night, lakhs of people left Bangalore to different parts of the state. Now the consciousness about COVID has grown so much that in many parts of the state, the migrants were not allowed inside. You know, they were stopped outside their villages mm -hmm. and the Bangalore Mysore road, you see, there was a kind of such a huge rush and then everybody blamed them. People are talking as if, you know, COVID has spread only because of internal migrants. But I don't think that's a situation that this needs to be discussed like that. You know, this is a kind of what I call a top down approach. Where do they go? There are no jobs in Bangalore. All establishments are closed. They have no money to pay rent because most of them were living in, you know, small one room uh, kind of, uh, how you see, accommodation. They are closed now because they have no rent to pay. Yesterday, somebody was telling me that in Mysore itself, after this pandemic uh, situation started, there are several houses that are lying vacant because people have left and there is nobody to come. So I think a very important issue for us sociologists is to find out what is happening to these people. So livelihood, according to me, is something that should not be discussed only in terms of loss of livelihoods in cities, but loss of livelihoods back home also. The migrant group, you know, I think we all know, for example, left their homes, many of them at least in a distress situation. And it is the same distress which is driving them back after COVID-19 uprooted their makeshift homes and took away their jobs. So one of the most threatening consequences of COVID-19 on migrants is the loss of food security. While those with uh, resources indulged in bulk buying, 
uh, this is what you're seeing in Bangalore now. The shops are open from 5 to 12. But buying is going on even at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock in the night. So when somebody called me up and said, look at these people, you know, the way they are rushing. They are going there at night because they work the whole day and have to buy little tidbits. They are not in a position to engage in bulk buy buying. So these are the migrant groups that came to Bangalore that, you know, followed uh, you know, they, that they, their livelihoods were dependent on small jobs. And so even if they are working now, the money comes only in the evening or once a week or once in three days or two days as the case may be. So, you know, it looks as if they are the ones breaking the lockdown rules and spreading the disease. So this is a serious question that we as students of sociology have to ponder over. And now coming to the big question of do the migrants want to return? As per a research study by Caritas, an organization that undertook this study in the 10 states of UP, Bihar, Jharkhand, Orissa, Madhya Pradesh, Telangana, West Bengal, Maharashtra, and Assam, supposed to be the 10 most affected states vis-a-vis -vis the migration issue. This study found that only 29% of the migrants said they don't want to go back. Uh, to the place from where they have gone back. There are other about 32% who are, you know, who want to return provided the situation improves. And the remaining about 39 to 40% are undecided. So it means that we are not sure what is awaiting them. Mm -hmm. And of these, you know, migrants, this study showed that nearly 90% had lost their livelihood base and 10% lost their family members. And talking of Narega, you know, which is seen as a big uh, uh, savior, this study showed that only 6% of those who had gone back were able to find jobs. And about 40% at, at the time of the study had no job cards and hence could not go under Narega. Now, India's, I'll just take about another five minutes. India's nationwide lockdown, no doubt disrupted everyone in some way or the other, but it was a migrant group that was dislocated. Their livelihood bases were shut down, public transport withdrawn, and hence most of them had no choice but to leave cities. But how? While some waited for trains, buses to be organized, there were those who started walking. Images of the painful, arduous journeys will remain in the annals of COVID-19 history for all times to come. But again, as I said in the beginning, did they have a choice? While the class that could afford uh, aeroplanes and uh, uh, private uh, travel by private transport uh, could do that. Actually, when you know the lockdown was lifted in phases, uh, whether it was from outside the country, or from other states, they could go for quarantine, either institutional or home-based, live in protected conditions. What happened to those people who travel in non-sanitized surroundings, lived in non-sanitized surroundings? The poor migrants were often left to fend for themselves. The government, we all know, announced a three and a half thousand crore food support program for the migrants. But as usual, the modus operandi uh, for operating this program uh, is still not known. We still do not know because all of us are aware that they are at the mercy of the employer and not the welfare state. So what's going to happen? We are unsure. Now, while we are on the subject, before I close on this question of situation, I would like to ask this question about women in these migrant groups and children, whether you know they are there in this group as workforce or you know as spouses, daughters, or uh, mothers or dependent relatives, what, where what is their position? Because when marginality intersects with gender, we know that the situation is further intensified. Whether migrant or non-migrant, Rich or poor, rural or urban, gender stereotypes operate in families and hence also in migrant groups. 
So women are the ones who cook and dispense food, take care of children and elderly. And how are they managing these crises now? Besides pressures of female biology, patriarchal values and practices, and a system that creates spaces for sexual exploitation by gender insensitive, unscrupulous persons, women in migrant groups have had to face a lot of violence. There are already studies showing that when they have gone back home, they are completely impoverished. They are no longer in a capacity to earn. So there is a lot of sexual abuse. Just one more quick thing before I go to policy and then I end this. You know, it's already uh, come to light that many girls now are out of school, uh, at least the migrant groups. You know, it is said that about 40% of the uh, children of migrant families are now without school. They have stopped studies because there were in most of the states arrangement for sending these kids to school. So they are with their parents. In, I, I, it must be happening in other parts of the country also, but in Karnataka, I know for sure, even in and around Mysore, child marriages are taking place, uh, complaints to police helpline have increased. And if daughters had continued in school, this would have been avoided. Now that they are with their parents moving around and going from you know the cities where the arrangements were made for their schooling. So this is another phase of the pandemic on which real research needs to be done. So now, one thing about situation, how do we deal with this? So migration is not a new phenomenon in India. It's a part of the process of both development and in, at individual and institutional levels and contributes significantly to transforming societies. But migration is also associated with the most unacceptable treatment of the marginalized and vulnerable. Notwithstanding the opportunities that migration has created for people, to aspire for and achieve social mobility, we should have what ILO once called fair migration policy. The biggest policy challenge is to counter the lapse back to poverty or falling deeper into poverty, which could be the immediate result of COVID-induced migration or long So receiving them back with dignity, these are some of the things we could think of back with dignity, quarantine, regular what medical checkups, with follow-ups are a must. If the stigma and fear associated with the pandemic are to be removed in communities where they have moved back. Now to conclude, I'll say the biggest challenge for the state and civil society is reversing the downturn, you know, that, uh, that is of course the uh, immediate task on hand, but the most difficult to achieve, I would say. So the priority of the policy is one, to bring back social dignity, and the other is to ensure that economic support is given to these families. And when I talk of policy now, I would say that it's not just the state, but the civil society. As the question is coming up here, what about academicians? I think I would end on that note by saying, I have been talking about this wherever I've spoken on this, I say that we have something to give back. Even the academics may not be a homogeneous community. However, you know, institutions and individuals who are in comfort zones in the academic world can share their knowledge, their resources, their institutional uh, ambience to help those children, to help those women, to help those youngsters who require, you know, some kind of skill development as well as skill up upgradation. So, uh, I would definitely say, you know, that the social security now with the kind of costs that the state has incurred uh, and, uh, you know, they, they are, the policy again is pro-rich, pro-capitalists and, you know, a plane can bring back uh, people who are stranded there. And of course, whether you come with the kit or whether you wear mask or whatever you do, a plane is a plane and a bus is a bus and a train is a train. So, you know, those differences like government quarters, you know, why, why, are, why do we live in that uh, like mindset when we think that the poor, the vulnerable, the labor can always get away with the minimum of conditions? Why can't they have a right to life of dignity? I think this is a lesson we at least must learn now and start thinking. 
So all I say is there is a, people are talking about the Kerala plantation workers model uh, where many uh, 50,000 to 60,000 plantation workers my, who are migrants from Northern states did not go back because there were certain security measures in place, perhaps with you know, locally relevant conditions, this can be tried, I would say, but the fears, lack of support, all that needs to be dealt with. So in conclusion, I would say that migrant support policy must include counseling, training in non-farm activities, use of indigenous knowledge, programs for skill upgradation, and, you know, also the involvement of the civil society in a very big way uh, to uh, actually help them because it is their work. All of us are workers. Everybody is a worker. We all work for survival. So you cannot migrate. That's all. They, you know, it is all our labor. Some of us are fortunate to stay where we are and give our whatever we have been able to learn, whereas they, for various reasons, are forced to use their labor without choice. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And it was nice being there. And I look forward to learning a lot from this. Thank you. Back to Dr. Jaya. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your thought provocative lecture as a chief guest and uh, I feel that you and Professor Paramjit Judge, including a guest of honor, Professor Rajamo, uh, Rajashekhar, uh, particularly have focused on the themes which will be discussed in the parallel session and more, more importantly in the plenary session because you, you have touched, Paramjit Judge has talked about how uh, the refugees are the most affected and how uh, in, the, in the context of diaspora, how uh, the low paid occupation workers like nurses are the most uh, you know, uh, crucial ones who face the brunt of this pandemic since they have to work in multiple places, work among the old aged people who have low immunity. And he also talked about how how India, Indian government uh, thought that this lockdown may last only for one month, but it is uh, beyond that. And it raised very, very important questions as to how the civil society organizations and religious organizations like Guru Dwara uh, intervene to help these migrant workers in various ways at the micro level. And, uh, and also lastly, he talked about how state governments uh, impose uh, certain rules not to allow these migrant workers to pass through their states. And uh, ma'am, you have touched upon the situation of the internal migrants uh, uh, in a very uh, important sociological uh, perspective in the sense that uh, you mentioned how migrants are not homogenous and you also talk about the important issues of how uh, the conditions of these migrant workers were while traveling and also at the point of their destination in their, uh, in their, dest uh, in their villages and towns. And uh, I think one of the take backs from uh, Ma'am's lecture is uh, that, um, uh, you know, how uh, children and women are the most uh, affected group. And I'm amazed as to how uh, you brought out the figures very beautifully from a well-researched group. 40% of children are out of school. And uh, in the context of migrants, you mentioned how 29% of the migrants do not want to go back and how uh, around 32% only wants to go back. And the rest, approximately 40% of the migrant workers are not sure uh, what they want to do. They can't say whether they will return or stay, stay, stay back in their place of origin. And I think the most important thing that you pointed out is the way uh, how sociologists should look at this whole thing as a top-down approach. I think earlier we talked about a bottom-up approach and now today I think we need to look at uh, the top-down approach from a sociological perspective. And also uh, lastly, you talk about uh, bringing in, restoring the dignity of these people. So thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, Professor Paramjit Judge. Thank you, Professor Raja Shekhar, our pro-vice chancellor.